All right, listen up, Avengers. Now, it didn't come from me, but somebody upstairs gave you a bad review. This could have been avoided if you hadn't played with no, something you don't I'm understand. Sorry. It is funny. It's a hoot that you don't get why we need it. Tony, I appreciate that you value criticism, but let's just ignore this. That's it. You just roll over, show your belly every time somebody snores. I, for one, thought you made a sequel almost as good as the first. We didn't. We weren't even close. Well, I'm the critic here, so maybe you should let me decide. Well, you did something right. See, Captain agrees. We're the Avengers. We can bust arms dealers all the live long day, but that up there, that's... That's the end game. Well, the best way to fight a bad review is with a good review. That's where I come in. This is Movie Night! Hello and welcome to Movie Night, in-depth reviews of your favorite blockbusters. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. For the sixth time on the program, we'll be discussing superhero films. If you'd like to take a look at the 30 movies I've already reviewed in that category, please check out the playlist link on screen now or in the video description below. Specifically tonight, we'll be taking a look at a poorly received superhero film from the 21st century with Michael Clark Duncan that led to the marriage of its two leads, as well as an eventual reboot. We'll also review the other 21st century superhero film with Michael Clark Duncan that led to the marriage of its two leads and a future reboot. Plus the new Avengers flick. We begin with Daredevil. Released on Valentine's Day in 2003, this $78 million neo-noir superhero production from director Mark Steven Johnson made just over $100 million in profit. Ben Affleck stars in the title role as a New York City lawyer blinded by toxic waste who uses his newly enhanced remaining senses to fight crime as an acrobatic martial artist in Hell's Kitchen. The original comic book character was written by Stan Lee, who was never one for subtlety, which is why Daredevil quite literally upholds the virtue justice is blind. It makes the culmination of an early fight scene so unorthodox, as Affleck taunts a criminal while watching him die. Later, in an attempt to repair his image, or maybe just his own guilt, he reassures a young bystander by saying, I'm not the bad guy, kid. Overloaded with noise, he goes to sleep every night in a special deprivation chamber, frustrated that he's unable to save everyone. This is a bruised and tortured hero that seeks unrepentant justice. Affleck does a surprisingly good job with the role, especially considering the thick contact lenses he wore during filming made him virtually blind himself. The auspiciously stacked cast also includes his future wife Jennifer Garner as a vengeful ninja with a propensity for push-up bras, Colin Farrell as an impatient hitman whose ability to throw darts really well is probably the lamest superpower ever, and Michael Clark Duncan as an ominously large criminal kingpin. They're joined by John Favreau, Joe Pantoliano, David Keith, and Leland Orser in smaller but pivotal supporting roles. Given the hammy material, everyone is better than likely expected, but the romantic thread at the film's core is ironically its weakest component. What may have worked behind the scenes between Ben and Jen clearly didn't translate on screen, as their exchanges feel stilted and stiff. Their introduction by way of a flirtatious fight, which reportedly took four full days to shoot, moves at half speed and looks decidedly pre-rehearsed and fake. Now while I appreciate Daredevil's superhuman sharpness to his remaining senses, there's far too many harness-assisted jumps and tosses in this movie that are simply unrealistic for these mortal characters. Looking like he raided the wardrobe closet from Battlefield Earth, Farrell is a sharp adversary, hurling shards of glass at our hero, who backflips out of the way in an awesome shot rather blatantly borrowed from Spider-Man. While the decision to set nearly 80% of the narrative inside a flashback is a bizarre choice, the traditional origin story is still well-paced and fun. When young Daredevil first wakes up following his mutating accident, the resulting scene is a visceral one, as the frightened boy struggles to control his new radar hearing abilities. It's this very deliberate and sensory sound mix that is paired wonderfully with Graham Ravel's score. But the accompanying pop soundtrack really dates this picture, combining the trite music of Nickelback, Hoobastank, and an overplayed Evanescence song during a training montage. I originally saw this movie in theaters and honestly don't remember liking it that much, but the extended director's cut version I rewatched for this review pleasantly surprised me. Reincorporating a half hour of material into the film, this new 133 minute runtime allows for so much more character development, something sorely lacking from the theatrical edition. 
It also bumped up the film to a more mature R rating, and includes an entirely new subplot involving Coolio, which ties a lot of the smaller threads together in a necessary way. Daredevil was Marvel's answer to DC Comics' Batman, and the two characters share a number of similarities with their backstory and darker realism, which is why it's a bit amusing that Affleck eventually got the opportunity to portray both on the big screen. Despite its mixed reception, this film did lead to the Garner-centric spin-off Elektra and a Netflix original series reboot in 2015, not to mention the three Affleck children who owe their very existence to their parents meeting on set. While the theatrical version was a misguided disappointment, the director's cut restores this feature to an enjoyable adventure worth seeing for all Marvel fans. Daredevil is an underrated film with redeeming characters, and here's what you had to say about it in the YouTube comments. The difference in opinion on this picture was striking, which was largely dependent on what version you saw. Criticizing the story and action, you thought this was meh. Which is what I originally rated this movie the first time I saw it, but the director's cut has changed my opinion. I'm giving this a 7 out of 10. For tonight's poll question, which superhero character do you think deserves a big screen reboot the most? Leave your response as a comment below. Next up, let's discuss Green Lantern. This June 2011 superhero effort from Martin Campbell was a high-profile disappointment for DC Comics, after the $200 million production only earned 219 at the box office. The PG-13 rated story opens with a CGI-heavy prologue, which unloads an overbearing amount of exposition. Those unfamiliar with the film would be forgiven for assuming this is an animated feature rather than live action. The excessive use of overly glossy visual effects are that bad. The handsome Ryan Reynolds stars as an irresponsible fighter pilot, who is granted a mysterious alien ring that gives him fantastic abilities, and a place among an intergalactic police force known as the Green Lantern Corps. I've been a fan of Ryan since his early days on Two Guys, A Girl, and a Pizza Place, and he's certainly capable here, playing a reckless womanizer who is baffled at his new gifts. But besides a tragic childhood event, we don't learn much about him. He shares a few moments of fleeting chemistry, though, with his future off-screen wife, the timelessly beautiful Blake Lively. Elsewhere, Peter Sarsgaard does convincing work as a misunderstood and menacing villain with telekinetic powers, while Mark Strong barks his usual bravado as an unforgiving alien co-worker who reminds Reynolds, fear is the enemy of will. Next lesson. <laughs> Feel that? Just the gravitational pull of your average son makes flying through space very dangerous. The bigger you are, the quicker you burn. Gravity's a bitch. Here, let me help you. Remember your enemy? He's not gonna play fair. Well, that's good advice. Angela Bassett, Tim Robbins, Jeffrey Rush, Clancy Brown, Michael Clark Duncan, and J.O. Sanders populate the large supporting cast, but none have anything substantial to do. In fact, several are abandoned entirely, including a nephew character who is never heard from again after his initial introduction. Or Reynolds' best friend, who plays a pivotal role early, but doesn't have a single line of dialogue after the 60-minute mark. Similarly, no one's motivation is adequately explained, including a pointless mid-credits tease for a sequel that would never be, which sees one character ignoring everything about the film for no discernible reason. When the few action sequences do arrive, however, they're particularly inventive and generally stimulating, especially a climactic face-off against a cloud of evil incarnate that threatens to consume Earth itself. Green Lantern's extended cut opens with a decently emotional chapter involving the tragic death of our protagonist's father. But it never should have been re-included, as a shorter flashback only a few minutes later conveys the same information in a much stronger way. The scene that separates these two redundant sequences is a grippingly shot and thrilling aerial dogfight that feels like a fun, modern-day twist on Top Gun, where Reynolds attempts to outthink and outmaneuver AI-flown aircraft. When the focus is on Ryan, the narrative is compelling and, more importantly, relatable, but frequent cutaways to these purple-skinned space police ruin the pacing of the lengthy two-hour film. An over-reliance on computer effects sees most of these non-human characters existing decidedly at the bottom of the uncanny valley, making it hard to take any of their dialogue seriously. The actual shooting style of the film works well, though, framing our actors in wide two-shots with colorful backgrounds, while the score from James Newton Howard fits the mood appropriately. Much like its central character, this movie has flashes of greatness that are unfortunately held back by its own shortcomings. The concept and imagery is certainly interesting, though, which is why a planned reboot for 2020 might not be a terrible idea. I enjoyed seeing this picture, even if it wasn't anything special. Green Lantern mishandles a flashy character with inconsistent results. And here's some of your reviews from the YouTube comments.
You were critical of the story and conflicted on the visuals, rating this a 4 out of 10. I thought it was alright myself. Finally tonight, let's review Avengers Age of Ultron. When Marvel's The Avengers premiered in 2012 after monumental buildup, it was a gigantic smash hit, quickly earning over $1.5 billion, making it the third highest grossing film in history. The first major crossover of these established characters was an unprecedented accomplishment that quickly cemented the Marvel Cinematic Universe as the biggest and most bankable franchise in Hollywood. It also left every other studio scrambling to create their own interconnected film series. But it was director Joss Whedon that perhaps had the toughest challenge, following up this monumental achievement with an even loftier sequel. And while he may not have succeeded, this $250 million follow-up certainly comes close, and is well on its way to the $1 billion mark. Released worldwide in April of 2015 and stateside on May 1st, this PG-13 rated extravagant action adventure reunites dozens of players from across the first 10 Marvel movies and yet another convoluted plot about world domination. During a whiz-bang opening siege on an enemy hideout, we're reintroduced to the titular heroes with a very cool sustained long take during the hectic action. Robert Downey Jr. returns for the fifth time as Iron Man, who inadvertently creates a villainous and sentient robot, voiced by James Spader, who endeavors to destroy mankind. Remarking on this creation known as Ultron, Downey laments, It's the end, the end of the path I started us on. Truthfully, the spark from his earlier performances is gone. With so much of his dialogue being delivered from inside his helmet, it felt a bit disconnected. But luckily, the Mammoth Ensemble cast also includes Chris Hemsworth, Mark Ruffalo, Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, Jeremy Renner, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Elizabeth Olsen, Paul Bettany, Colby Smulders, and Samuel L. Jackson. Given the fragmented nature of the narrative, it's honestly impressive that each and every one of these characters has their own individual moment to shine and a chance to evolve by the picture's end. Sure, some contribute more than others, Renner receives lots of much-needed development, while a few seem like an afterthought. Hemsworth isn't given much to do outside of a single fetch quest. A surprise romantic development between Johansson and Ruffalo also feels particularly out of place, especially in a movie already so overloaded. There's also a bevy of crowd-pleasing cameo size appearances as well, from a half-dozen former sidekicks. By now, audiences know what to expect from this talented group of highly paid A-listers, but the real joy comes from watching their playful banter during the expositional scenes. The aftermath of a party is especially enjoyable. Their chemistry makes for some undeniable laughs, as they take turns attempting to lift Thor's hammer. Besides being a perfectly balanced character-building scene, it sets up an immensely effective payoff later, when the mighty instrument is wielded. Unfortunately, though, this sequence is also a reminder of who is sitting the picture out, with Gwyneth Paltrow being the most missed. While Taylor Johnson's quick-sprinting character is involved in creative ways, his delivery is void of charm or enthusiasm. Instead, it's his former Godzilla co-star that really delights. Olsen is a fierce and troubled character who uses her telekinetic mind control powers reluctantly and without total control. And can I just say that between her, Scarlet, RDJ, Kobe, and both of the Chris's, there are a lot of very attractive people in Age of Ultron. You two can still walk away from this. No, we will. If you believe in peace, then let us keep it. I think you're confusing peace with quiet. Yeah, huh? What's the vibranium for? I'm glad you asked that because I wanted to take this time to explain my evil plan. <laughs> There are a few bad guys in the MCU that can live up to the scene-stealing performance of Tom Hiddleston's portrayal of Loki, but three-time Emmy Award-winning Spader is just as good. His voice-only performance exudes so much charismatic wit it's impossible not to be entranced by the 11-foot metallic man he's portraying. Although I suspect seeing his actual likeness could have gone a long way to amplifying his extraordinary talents, which were a bit diminished without his facial cues. He explains his curious existence by stating, Everyone creates the thing they dread. Even at two and a half hours, Marvel's longest picture to date often feels a bit rushed. Ironically, however, it lacks a necessary urgency during the second act. There are a hefty amount of great action sequences to break up this pacing. A fantastic fight between Iron Man and Hulk is particularly enjoyable, but there's little consequence driving the actual narrative. Instead, it's the individual elements and light-hearted one-liners that really make this picture so much fun. Renner sarcastically mocking a teammate behind his back, or Evans providing a shield-assisted alley-oop to his Asgard friend make for some truly awesome moments. The collaborative efforts from composers Brian Tyler and Danny Elfman are suitably bombastic and appropriate, but it's the reused themes from Alan Silvestri's original score that resonate the loudest. With over 3,000 separate VFX shots, this picture could have easily gotten out of hand, but Whedon keeps the drawn-out conflicts well choreographed and staged, culminating in a ridiculous climax with devastating possibilities. The CGI not only helps men fly and robots speak, it was also used to digitally remove signs of Scarlet's real-life pregnancy. 
but the integration for all these elements into the wide IMAX frame is near seamless. Although it's missing the wow factor that made the original so enjoyable, this sequel is another top-tier installment from Marvel, worth watching more than once. Avengers Age of Ultron is organized chaos resulting in marvelous blockbuster fun. And here's what you had to say about it. A fantastic adventure from start to finish, we both rated this in awesome, agreeing that it was just slightly less than the first Avengers. Finally tonight, let's see what you're saying about films currently playing in theaters. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review at the JPMN hashtag. Next week we'll be reviewing five of the crappiest movies from winter 2015. The Wedding Ringer, The Boy Next Door, Jupiter Ascending, Fifty Shades of Grey, and Hot Tub Time Machine 2. Almost all of which are new on home media. If you've seen these films, share your opinions by voting in the polls below or by leaving a comment review. I read them all and will include the best in the next episode. If you'd like to watch more movie night videos, check out the related reviews on the right or click subscribe if you'd like to see more of this show in the future. Also, be sure to follow me on social media for updates and exclusive content. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time, have a good movie night.